Greetings everyone, my name is Joshua Wade. I am the owner and operator of A Picture in Time History. I am also a contractor for the George Rogers Park Park. I function as a battlefield guide and historian. I am here tonight to talk to you about the Battle of Pekaway. However, before I dive into the events that occurred here on August 8, 1780, I want to take a moment to discuss the events that led up to this climactic battle of the American Revolutionary War in the Western Theater. Tensions began to build between the colonists and the Native Americans in 1772 when three surveying companies, the Ohio Company, the Loyal Land Company, and the Greenbrier Company, broke a non-expansion treaty between the British Empire and Native American tribes in the upper Ohio Valley, which forbade expansion west of the Allegheny Mountains. These companies hired such men as George Rogers Clark as guides. Clark was an avid frontiersman who had dreams of grandeur to go west and began carving land, large farms, and homesteads out of the vast wilderness so they could sell the land to those looking to start a new life in the west. The first expedition was launched into northern Kentucky by June 16, 1774. The first settlement, called Harrodstown, was established. This, along with the ever-increasing hostilities around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania brought the tension to a head. The war that resulted because of these trespasses would come to be known to us as Lord Dunmore's War, which was named after Virginia's royal governor. Clark would find himself in the thick of it. On May 2, 1774, George Rogers Clark was commissioned a captain in the Virginia militia. In early July, Clark and eight companies of frontiersmen turned militiamen under British officer Major Angus MacDonald burst across the Ohio River and cut deep into the heart of the upper Ohio Valley. The first village to fall was Wakatomica, which was promptly burned to the ground along with all its crops. Every village which Major MacDonald and his eight companies came across suffered the same fate. MacDonald's forces was to cut as the MacDonald's force was to act as the vanguard of Dunmore's army, which at that time was still being assembled. MacDonald's mission was to demoralize the natives and put them on the defensive. Nearly two months later, Lord Dunmore's forces, numbering almost 3,000 militiamen, linked up with MacDonald's forces in Ohio. By October 17, 1774, after many hard-fought battles, the exhausted native tribes opened peace talks with Lord Dunmore. Several days later, an unwritten treaty of Camp Charlotte was agreed upon. A physical treaty would not be signed until the following spring, but it was not to be, as the American Revolution broke out on April 19, 1775. George Rogers Clark was in Virginia when he heard of the action fought at Lexington and Concord, and being a staunch American patriot, he was all for the rebellion. In February 1776, George Rogers Clark returned to Kentucky upon receiving news of new hostilities between the Kentuckians and Native tribes in the Upper Ohio Valley. Clark did not merely return to defend his new home. He intended to fulfill his dreams of grandeur. He did so on June 6, 1776, when he convened a council of all of Kentucky's settlements. During the council, Clark explained all the events that had taken place in the East until he had departed Virginia. He then called for two representatives to be elected to represent Kentucky in the Virginia Assembly. Clark was among two men elected to be Kentucky's delegation. Clark's first mission was to petition Virginia to recognize Kentucky as a county and to procure 24 gates of gunpowder from the newly established Virginia militia. After two months of heated debate, Kentucky gained its status as a county and was granted its case of powder to protect its settlements. In 1777, Kentucky's first regiment was mustered by raising a company in each of Kentucky's settlements. 
On March 5, 1777, elections for officers were held at Harrodsburg. John Bowman was elected colonel. Anthony Bledsoe was elected lieutenant colonel. George Rogers Clark was elected major. And William James, William and James Harrod, Benjamin Logan, and John Todd were all elected captains. However, fortune favored Clark. James Bowman abandoned his post and returned to his home in the east, while Anthony Bledsoe re resigned his post. Clark was soon elected colonel. Kentucky's fate now lay solely on Clark's shoulders. Clark worked tireless, tirelessly to defend Kentucky from Native American war parties, which were raiding into northern Kentucky, and by December 1777, the raids took such a toll that Kentucky consisted of only three settlements and its regiment was, re was reduced to around 200 militiamen. Kentucky was on the verge of a complete collapse, but the winter of 1777 to 1778 brought a relief from the incessant native raids and much needed resupply. During that winter, Clark began to recruit spies and draw up plans for a major counterattack against the British who had backed the natives by supplying them with arms and gunpowder. By the summer of 1778, George Rogers Clark was on the offensive. Having been well informed on the affairs in Illinois and Indiana territories, he began his counteroffensive in Illinois, where he famously captured Fort Kaskaskia. After he had secured the region, Clark marched on Fort Vincennes, which Clark's men laid siege to on February 23, 1779. On the morning of February 25, 1779, British commander Henry Hamilton surrendered Vincennes. Clark then returned to Kentucky later that year, but one thing still loomed heavy on his mind. One threat. That was a native confederation located here at the village of Peckaway in modern day Springfield, Ohio. Even in the wake of his great victories, he had for not forgotten the hundreds of dead Kentuckians that came as a result of the native raids throughout 1777. With this now at the forefront of his mind, he began planning one last great campaign. Clark spent the remaining part of 1779 and all of his spring in 1780 recruiting soldiers and acquiring supplies for his Ohio campaign. Unfortunately, the campaign encountered disaster before it even began. When Clark and some of his officers were making their way up the Ohio River toward the mouth of the Licking River by way of barge, it took on water and ruined all but 1,500 pounds of the 3,400 pounds of grain that was to supply the army on his campaign into Ohio. Clark would now have to force his men to supplement some of their daily rations with what could be found on their long march to Pequot. Undaunted, Clark pressed forward with his plans. Early in the summer of 1778, Clark had raised a small regiment of frontiersmen and instructed them. Earlier in the summer of 1780, Clark raised a small regiment of frontiersmen and instructed them to construct two blockhouses at the mouth of the Licking River, where he now expected 1,000 more soldiers that would accompany him into Ohio. By August 1st, all of the soldiers and officers had arrived. Virtually all of them were frontiersmen, except for Major George Slaughter and his 50 Virginian regular line infantry. The army was accompanied by a small division of cavalry and three cannons, one brass six-pound cannon and two iron four-pound cannons. Each cannon had a dedicated four-horse team, and all three cannons were manned by a 26-man gun crew commanded by Captain Robert George. Another four-horse team pulled the army supply wagon. On August 2nd, 1780, George Rogers Clark finally set his plan in motion. Clark and his army marched east along the Ohio River, the Ohio River's north shore, until they found the mouth of the Little Miami. There, they forded the Ohio. For Clark, 
This was like Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon. This was the largest campaign of his career. The army marched in two columns. Clark led the first column, and Benjamin Logan, Clark's second in command, led the second column. The supply wagon and the cannons were between these two columns. While on the march, the army was screened by a large force of skirmishers on all sides. Little happened on the march to Clark's first target, which was the town of Chillicothe. Chillicothe was one of the few towns in the Ohio Territory that was a British and Native American colony. On the morning of August 7, 1780, George Rogers Clark and his Army of Kentucky came within five miles of Chillicothe. Clark's scouts reported that the natives were rapidly evacuating their homes in the face of the Army's advance. Clark believed that this might be the decisive blow he was looking for and ordered his army to march at the double. When they arrived later that afternoon, Chillicothe was a ghost town. Thanks to a loyalist sympathizer by the name of John Clary, who had rode ahead of Clark before his campaign started, Clary warned, that the, nati warned the natives and British of Clark's pending campaign. This meant that nothing of value remained in Chillicothe. Nonetheless, Clark ordered the men to fan out and loot what little remained, and torch the homes of the enemy. British soldiers had already set fire to their blockhouse earlier that morning. Clark issued orders for his army to make preparations to bivouac at Chillicothe for the night. They did so by forming hollow square around the army's three cannons and supply wagon and horses. Being deep in enemy territory, few men got any sleep, and those who did manage to fall asleep were rudely awakened by a thunderstorm. The, th the thunderstorm unleashed torrents of rain upon the army of Kentucky. Late morning brought relief from the misery of the night. Clark ordered the men to fire their weapons by company, but many discovered that their charges were foul. This meant that soldiers spent most of their morning preparing their weapons for battle. Meanwhile, Clark sent James Guthrie, his lead cavalry scout, ahead of the army to determine what the enemy's disposition was at Pegaway. It was several hours later, after the army had begun its march on Pegaway, that Guthrie rejoined the army. Guthrie reported the enemy appeared determined to stand and fight. This encouraged Clark, who rallied his soldiers and urged them forward. It was about half past 2 p.m. when Clark arrived on the south bank of the Mad River. Clark later reported to Thomas Jefferson, quote, We arrived in full sight of the town and its outposts, a plain of half a mile in width laying between us. I had an opportunity of viewing the situation and, and motion of the enemy near their works. This was Clark's Battle of the Nations as his army would face off against the Shawnee, Delaware, Silverheels, Makoches, Aquitsika, Kispoko, Mingos, and Wyandotte tribes. After a few moments of reflection, Clark formed a plan of battle. He would detach a division under the command of Floyd, Lynn, and Harry, three of his infantry commanders. They were to secure Clark's left flank and make a wide outflanking attack on the village of Pequaway, while Clark would take his own division and drive back the Native American center and win space for the rest of the army to deploy. Benjamin Logan was to take a small troop of cavalry and ride east along the Mad River to find a way around the Springfield Cliffs and cut off any possible Native American retreat from Pequaway. Three hours of fierce fighting took place and by 5.30, the Army of Kentucky was able to drive back the natives' first line of defense, which retreated in good order back to their defensive earthworks and village structures. 
At this point, Clark's army had become disorganized while fording the river and crossing through patches of trees. So he took a moment to reorganize them and issue new orders. Floyd, Lynn, and Herod, were, their division, were to threaten the native right flank and drive them from hill to hill in what Clark says in a surreptitious direction. Clark would lead the, the rest of the men, now formed into a battle line, across a broad front down the prairie, which lay between the village and the Matt River. As they advanced, native warriors continuously attacked into the rear of Clark's army which prompted him to send a small detachment to fill the void between his army and the ranks of Floyd, Lynn, and Herod to prevent any more attacks. Clark sent orders to Captain Joseph McCurdy to charge his company and capture the enemy readout. The readout was captured, but McCurdy was mortally wounded when a bullet shot off his right trigger finger and smashed his breastbone. Still, with forward movement and his, and his army taking ground, Clark could not breathe a sigh of relief quite yet. On his left flank, Floyd, Lynn, and Herod's division were briefly routed as they approached the British fortification. Native warriors, which were previously unknown to Clark and his soldiers, dashed out of the fort, screaming war cries, firing their muskets, and brandishing war clubs. Clark ordered his men to form square and reserve their fire until the natives were within 40 paces. Once they were within range, they fired a volley which inflicted terrible losses on the advancing enemy. With the second volley, the enemy advance was halted and the enemy was routed. In their route, they fled into the trees, but many returned to the floor fort, where they continued to fire upon Clark's army. Clark ordered the army's three cannons forward. The, the cannon crews fi fired so many rounds that parts of the palisade was cut down. Clark ordered some of the soldiers to storm the fortification. However, they found what they found were those that were However, they found that those that were not killed by the cannonballs had fled through the back door. The destruction of the British blockhouse and palisade marked the end of the Battle of Pequaway. The natives were able to retreat north to the modern day, modern day Piqua, Ohio, in good, good order, as Benjamin Logan spent the whole battle trying to find a way around the natives. By the time he found a ford upriver that was not blocked by the high cliffs, which remain to this day, he had missed the retreating natives by quite some time. Amazingly, as many thought the battle had ended, a native man came running out of the village screaming, don't shoot, I'm white. But no one heard him, and some of the soldiers nearby shot him down. When the men ran over to examine this individual, they discovered this native was no native at all. It was Joseph Rogers, George Rogers Clark's cousin. Joseph Rogers requested to see his cousin one last time. Here's what one of Clark's soldiers later recalled in an interview. Quote, Clark rode up and remarked that he was sorry to see him in that situation and expressed an opinion that Joseph should have escaped and joined the army as he knew of its advance. But Joseph said he couldn't. He was taken to the rear and died two hours later. But why did Clark act so cold towards his dying cousin? In 1776, Joseph Rogers was captured while transporting gunpowder to Harrodsburg. From then on, the Shawnee took him in as one of their own and regarded him with high respect. Clark had known this for some time, as he would occasionally receive reports from his spies, captured dispatches, prisoners of war, and many other sources. But Clark dismissed these reports as he wished to not believe that one of his own family members was a turncoat. The Army of Kentucky bivouacked at Peckaway in the same way they had at Chillicothe. 
by forming hollow square around the army supplies and cannons. The following morning of August 9th, Clark ordered the men to resupply themselves with the many crops that surrounded Peckaway and then burned the rest. In all, more than 700 acres of Native American crops were destroyed. Explicit orders were given on how to bury the fallen soldiers of the Army of Kentucky. Graves were to be prepared within the homes of Peckaway, the fallen soldiers were to be laid to rest, and then the structures burned over top of them. This way, no village would be erected on the site again, as it was against Native American religious practices to desecrate burial sites. Later that day, Clark convened a war council, which convinced him to return to Kentucky. Clark wanted to pursue the natives, but was faced with the fact that the army was terribly short on provisions. On August 10th, the army began their long trek back to the mouth of the Licking River, reaching it on August 14th, 1780. At this time, Clark thanked the men for their service, saying, quote, Nothing could excel the few regulars and Kentuckians that composed this little army in bravery and implicit obedience to the two orders, each company vying with the other who should be most subordinate." End quote. The army was then paid and dismissed by company. The Battle of Peckaway was the largest battle fought west of the Allegheny Mountains during the American Revolutionary War. The campaign cost Clark nearly 50 militiamen killed and a score wounded. The Native Confederation lost over 80 warriors killed and an unknown number wounded. The Battle of Peckaway was the largest battle. It, was, it would be the last battle fought in the Midwest in the United States until the War of 1812. Thank you for your time.